Okay, so it should be good. Okay, good. We got that. Thank you. Uh, okay, we got a couple more people coming in. Perfect. And if everyone can mute themselves, that would be easier, just so there's no background noise, that would help. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions as we go through, please feel free to put it in the chat, or we'll, we'll have questions at the end. So, um, you're good. Okay, what time is it? Okay, we'll give it another minute. We've got a couple more people coming in. Okay, great. So we've got a couple more people coming in and then we will get the show on the road, so to speak. Okay. All right, and so we are recording and we are good to go on that. Um, all right, so um, Michael, I'm gonna keep letting people in as they come in. I'm no, gonna do a little introduction. Wait a second if you want to, I'm-, I'm Okay, all right. Let me, let me start the introduction and then we ca I can go back and let people in and then you can begin. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So hi everyone, welcome to the Park City Museum's lecture series. We're so glad to have you all tonight. Um, this lecture was postponed from March um, and we are now doing it Zoom so to keep everyone safe and healthy. Um, for other lectures that we will have, they're on our website, upcoming lectures. So uh, please feel free to join us in the future too. Um, Michael Rudder is going to be doing a presentation tonight, and it's called Body Women of the West, The Myths and Realities of Prostitution. Uh, he, Michael is a recipient of the Ben Franklin Award for Excellence and the Rocky Mountain Book Publishers Award. An addicted fly fisherman, his outdoor essays have been published from Yale University to Outdoor Life. He worked with American Experience on the Wild West series, which Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. He has been a fellow and an AT&T AT scholar. Um, his books on Western themes include Colorado Mad Mad Madams, uh, Summer 2020, that's coming up. Um, upstairs, oh, that was Summer 2020, but that's been postponed a little bit, I think, but he'll tell us about that. Um, upstairs Girls, Prostitution in the American West. Um, see, Myths and Mysteries of the Old West, Wild Bunch Women, um, and a lot of other uh, books. Uh, he teaches advanced writing at Brigham Young University and lives in Orem, Utah with his wife, Sherry, three cats, and a very large spoiled dog named Star. So without, oh, with, uh, without further ado, I'm gonna let Michael take over. Michael, thank you for doing this. We appreciate it. And um, I will continue to post people in, so. Well, thank you. I'm happy to be here today. This is a pleasure for me. Let's, uh, let's dive right in. Uh, first of all, let's see if I can get set up here. Uh, all right. Uh, special thanks to Diane and the staff of the Park City Museum. I have used, hang on just a second. My, I, I thought I muted my phone. Sorry, uh, here, sure. Uh, <laughs> um, I would like to thank you, y'all because I have been using this uh, the facilities for a long time. In fact, uh, I consider the museum a valuable resource and I uh, enjoy going there. I would like to say that on my Western projects, uh, these books I have researched and done some research uh, at, uh, at the Park City Museum. I, uh, my new book, which has been postponed because of COVID, will probably come out next year. Uh, I don't have a book cover for it. Uh, I, I often watercolor uh, really quickly to dive into my subject. So I threw a few of my watercolors on, which will probably end up as a visual. And a couple of the ladies, which I am going to talk. Sorry, folks. Uh, uh, my clicker backwards. So not only have I uh, uh, used it, I when I uh, researched for the A&E Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, uh, uh, episode, I used the museum. I also could say that I have used uh, the facilities and come just to be inspired for uh, other Western projects. You know what? I'm going to click over. Sorry. Okay. 
Uh, and I, I can say that I, I've done a number of textbooks, which I didn't use the museum. Historians and poets sometimes have to stop and make a living. And, and that would be the situation with these. So with that said, let's jump in to the, the discussion. I, I wanted to use this line from the moment I started this, uh, this book project, which will be out next summer. And I started it in the introduction like this. You can no longer smell the sweat, but the American West was real to those who lived in it. I'm not sure if I was getting a little uh, overboard. I said to my editor, this is the only line I don't want you to touch. For some reason, uh, he kept it in, but the land in many ways was a, was a dream. It was a business venture for both men and women. And uh, I have talked about boom towns and settlements and so forth. And I found that this setting interesting. This was from Silverton, uh, Colorado. Oh gosh. Yeah, I guess. Okay. I, for a long time, have been a fly fisherman. I am pretty much obsessed by stories and voices. I majored concurrently in, in English and in history, went to graduate school afterwards, and I have had a historian's passion for history, especially the American West, but like Norman McLean in A River Runs Through It, he said, I'm haunted by water. And I understand that. I'm haunted by water also, but I'm also haunted by voices and stories that haven't been told. And as I started some of these book projects, that was my primary objective. I would like to suggest too that the, the, the people that we're writing about, especially women in the West, which is become my specialty, are not just wallpaper or, or specks of dust to be swept under the carpet. As T.S. Eliot would say, we're preparing faces to meet the faces. And in this situation, we have a very interesting dynamic. We shouldn't be surprised, though, that many of the narratives that we look at are incomplete. They're, they're contradictory or puzzling. Period accounts are very important, but it would be unwise to take what is written uh, at its face value. Uh, objectivity and accurate reporting were not part of the job description. And a reporter's literary license could be very broad and very misleading sometimes, uh, depending also on the women in this case that he was reporting about there almost would be no mention of names. It was almost always uh, women uh, that would be mentioned professionally. Men's names were never, uh, rarely ever mentioned in newspapers. So we have, uh, we don't have a lot of information. The names and the, pro and, the, and the other information was often swept under the table with bribes. The, the education system in most of the areas in the West were funded by prostitution, fees, and bribes, and other kinds of uh, 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 other kinds of um, taxation that might occur. So we have this um, we have this interesting scenario. Um, I think too maybe we ought to stop for just a moment and talk about what are myths. And what are realities, in, at least in this case? I am primarily a, a storyteller. I love the Western stories. I have done some very hardcore uh, historical research, but sometimes I like to just involve myself in questions and look carefully at what's going on. I think it might be a good idea to consider these four questions as we dive into this discussion. Who were the improper women of the West? What was it like in this profession? What was the reality? And then perhaps uh, the last question that we might address briefly this evening is what's a nice girl doing in a place like this? Nearly every time I have a question and answer after a discussion, I almost always 
uh, am asked these questions continually. So I assume that that's probably maybe a good place to start and maybe a good place for us to just think as we, as we scaffold this experience. We're going to take a little drink. So that we uh, are, are maybe going to answer some of these questions, hopefully, um, hopefully deal with them as we, we labor in this discussion. First of all, I think myths, mysteries, we have a lot of really interesting opportunities that there are, uh, well, a there's a lot of information and we'll talk about in just a second. Not all of the entertainment, not all of the literature and, and many of the movies that we've, that we've looked at have taken an aspect of the Western experience, but they haven't always dealt with it carefully or thoroughly and probably that's okay. Maybe we need to get a little background uh, and look back on our history to take a look at what was happening and perhaps even to interpret that. I would like to suggest though that there were a lot of, uh, there were a lot of interesting, uh, there are a lot of interesting things being written right now that I think are, are very important. I think, can you see that cursor? Uh, maybe not. Um, the Lonesome Dove was very interesting, but everything as we'll talk about in just a moment is written through a filter. I, I think also, let's take a look at uh, a quote that's off. I, I've used it in several of my books, but it's an, uh, the quote from a really interesting uh, uh, short story, The Outcasts of Poker Flats. And, and let me just read a couple of uh, bits of this. It had lately suffered the loss of several thousand dollars two valuable horses and a prominent citizen. It was experiencing a spasm of virtuous reaction, quite as lawless and unforgiving as any of the acts that had provoked it. A secret committee had determined to rid the town of all improper persons. This was done permanently in regard of two men who were then hanging from the boughs of a sycamore in the gulch and temporarily in the banishment of certain other objectionable characters. I regret to say that some of these were ladies. This gives us, I think, a really interesting setup. Mark Twain remembers working at the same time. By the way, Mark Twain and Bret Hart did not like each other. Uh, it's fascinating, I think, to take a look at, at this because it tells us a lot. The American public at the time was living the Western experience, but it was also back East. It was like there were two different bodies of people, the people that were sweating on the frontier and those who were experiencing it through literature and letters from folks. It's a fascinating look that uh, Bret Hart and Mark Twain really fueled the shape of the Eastern, the East Coast's fascination, which would later lead in the 1890s to how we redefine the West. The West has been defined many, many times. And they wrote of jumping frogs, of outlaws, of miners and gamblers and ladies, and the gold rush. They exaggerated the violence sometimes, but they talked about it. By the way, I've done a really interesting lecture at, about Mark Twain, who talks about foreshadowing violence. Mark Twain was an interesting character, uh, and and both were newspapermen. The but they they were in this they were Easterners, but they're in this lawless uh, town, absent of structure, and in many ways base, and they uh, needed the pure mild gavel, galvanizing influence, Hart said, of, of a pure woman. And yet, as we look at this story, it becomes really interesting. The Duchess's final sacrifice, she's actually quite a noble character. If you haven't looked at that story for a while, it might be interesting. I would like to also suggest that in many ways, the West, while it seems commonplace perhaps to us sometimes, is uh, the base of much of our cultural mythology, like the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, were for other cultures or Beowulf. We have, we have a culture that like the Greeks, we kept redefining over and over. Let's take a look too now for just a minute at the word myth and the word reality. And I don't think we'll come to any satisfactory conclusions, but let's look a little bit at what, uh, what we're working with. So at least we've 
cleared some of the pathway a little. These words are, uh, are confused a lot, and that's okay. I, I think that sometimes English teachers and maybe historians too overcomplicate it. But a myth is often from the oral tradition. It's different kinds of stories. There are differences, of course, between, between myths and folklore and legend. But the truth is we overlap those terms all the time. A myth is, a tr again, often the oral tradition, but there's different little technicalities that an English teacher would nail you on. But in real life, there are specifics, but we let them overlap and I think that's fine. But a myth is a traditional story, uh, especially one concerning the early history of a people and it can deal with supernatural or phenomenon uh, in, in Greek mythology, we have creation uh, myths. But we use the term myth also to mean uh, a little more than that. Uh, it, 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 can, it can be false, it could be something that's false, but it also uh, can be part of, oops, let me go schedule that here. It can be part of what we're doing. Folklore is the traditional beliefs frequently from the oral tradition, passed down by word of mouth from gener generation to generation. And legend is, my goodness, I've got a trigger finger here, uh, legendary, uh, uh, is a, a traditional story that um, may, it's not necessarily historical. It might be based and often is based in truth, but it's what we would call undocumented. Reality, whatever that means, and philosophers have written on this forever, but I think perhaps reality is anything that exists. I think T.S. Eliot, who I really like, um, has said in his poem, The Hollow Man, between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act follows the shadow. So there are shadows, there are dark points, there are different things that we talk about, our cultural and our uh, experiences come into play here. And reality is something that's close to reality. It's realistic. And everything that is and has been, whether we understand it or not, is real. But what we have is a conflict sometimes between these two. People will draw lines and die on some of these hills. One of the problems, though, is that much of what we're looking at, is, especially in this subject, doesn't really have a lot of documentation because this was a culture, this was a group of people, a group of women, who were, who were really pretty much shuffled under, under the they were binary, like specks of flies. Women, especially women of easy virtue, were not really written or talked about. In fact, they didn't show up very often. And if they did, no one was doing ethnographies or work about uh, or writing about them because it wasn't considered important in the culture. Now we can look back. But anyway, let me also... Um, add a quote here by Joseph Campbell, who actually I studied with for a short time. I took some seminars from him. Fascinating man. I really have enjoyed him. He goes in and out of style, but he's always there. It's sort of like Oxford shoes um, or maybe a button down collar. But myths, he said, are inevitably bound to the society and time in which they occur. So I think that's important. Sometimes we peel things out and it's interesting, but it, it, it's sometimes out of context. And it cannot be divorced from its culture and its environment. Myths function as a provision of cultural framework for society and for people. And myths are stories, which again, I come back to. I think that's so important. The parables are taught in stories. We use stories for uh, examples and scenarios. But myths are stories. Um, uh, of the search by, for, by men and women throughout the ages for meaning, significance, and we go back and we look at them and we actually redefine them. Myths touch some, according to Campbell, some eternal or uh, something that is internal or understood. It kind of helps us know a little bit about who we are. Let's see, we're popping up. Um, as students, uh, Libby Thompson, uh, Squirrel Tooth Alice, 
interesting. Maybe sometime we'll come back and we'll talk about some stories about many of these fascinating women who lived mostly in their persona and didn't have a lot written about them. We just don't know very much. And as students of our heritage, we understand that traditional documents, pulp fiction, uh, current trends, Hollywood have not always gotten it right. Prostitution has been overly romanticized and the soil doves described in song and story are frequently myth and they're uh, a blend of some realism and some mythology. In a world of political correctness, I would suggest that we should never become too sophisticated though to delight in mountain flowers or a folk tale for its own sake. I think we, it, it, perhaps if you've uh, had uh, uh, some experience watching Western movies, we appreciate that the journalist Maxwell Scott in that classic John Ford film, The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance, uh, Liberty ba Balance, sorry, not Balance, uh, said something that we hear all the time. And he go, he's talking to, to a, a, a person and he goes, this is the West, sir. When the legend becomes fact, print the legend. The, this, this becomes interesting. This profession is interesting to us because we know it academically a hundred years later. And it's akin, I think, to our fascination with the bubonic plague, Shakespearean plays, the Salem witch trials, serial killers. The women in question here are from a bygone era and that somehow makes it a little easier and insulates us and their occupation may seem benign. And although um, it wasn't always some, some interesting facts, metal stays, for example, in Molly Price's corset turned a bullet and a surly madam named Leah the Lion, you could read about these in uh, uh, my, my book coming up next summer on Colorado Madams. But Leo the Lion chased a pistol around to a young Lillian Powers who lived to a ripe old age, we have a lot of information on her, and said, because this is a really, this is a really cutthroat profession, bitch, leave town or I'll kill you. Now, that's the West uh, that's uh, important. I think, and let me just make a, a brief comment too, that now that the West is embedded as an important, I'm going to read this uh, really so I get this quote right. I'm, I'm actually quoting myself. Uh, now that the West is embedded in our, uh, well, I'm not, wait, sorry. Uh, now, uh, now that the West is embedded as a, an important part of our American history and mythology, it's natural to look at the lives of these improper women through romantic rev or revisionist filters. Retrospection doesn't always seem as sordid or as deadly, especially when brothels have been turned into restaurants, into travel bureaus, or historic monuments. Of course, it's even trendier, and in Park City, we have this, if you have a brothel or a place that was a brothel that has a ghost. So we, we have uh, all those right here. Let me uh, also dive back into those questions. Let me just take a drink. And let's go into more, a little bit more detail. Let me, uh, look at my, uh, Sherry, what time is it? I... Okay, we're just on task. Who were uh, these uh, improper women of the West? Behind the makeup and the gaudy clothing, there were real women living from day to day. There, uh, even though this is the world's, quote, oldest profession, I would like to suggest that it had a poor retirement plan. There was a lot of disillusionment. There was disease and there was a lot of disenfranchisement. It was not really glamorous as we sometimes see, but life itself wasn't real glamorous either. We didn't have electric lights. We didn't have indoor toilets clothing and starvation where it was always possible. There wasn't always a plan B, but we have a hard life. And I think that is reflected in everything, but especially in this profession, because it was uh, difficult. 
as we'll talk about in a minute, some people may have made a lot of money, but most didn't. And most of the time, it didn't have a real happy ending. If you look at number one, that's a really rich madam who lived to a fairly ripe old age. And she was the one that we know about, Jane Rogers, from Denver. But she, we know about her because she was successful. So many were not. One of the points that is interesting is the people we read about were the ones who continually uh, possibly were in the news or were able to promote their own uh, PR campaigns because in this profession, any, any notoriety was generally good. As we look at number two, and there's a early picture of Jenny, but we have a number of other interesting characters in the bottom of that, uh, in, of that collage. Poker Alice, we have Maddie Silks, we have Dora Topham, we have Lulu. Some of them will end up taking their lives. Most of them were not particularly happy. Many had serious alcoholic problems, but they were the ones who were at the pinnacle of their trade. Unfortunately, they didn't have financial planners. Many of them ended up broke, but they would be running CEO Fortune 500 companies today. Many of them were good managers, good money managers, but maybe made some poor personal choices. Number three is a child. There were often children who ran in the streets as a byproduct of prostitution. There were kids who were sometimes well cared for, but often not. The, the, the parent or the mother, and sometimes the mother and the father, but generally the mother was often busy. Frequently these children were neglected. I have a project that I'm gonna do one of these times on the children of uh, prostitutes. I think many, I think it's an interesting topic, but one of the things I think we need to address is this group of children. Not only were the mothers disenfranchised, but the children were scorned also. Number four, we have uh, some of the more tragic uh, scenarios that occurred. In this case, we have a Chinese woman who lived her entire life behind bars. She was brought over from China, sold, and I talk about this in Upstairs Girls, but the life of a Chinese prostitute uh, was extraordinarily difficult, and there was simply, it was almost a, a, a no-win scenario. Many lived their lives indoors, and the conditions were pretty, were pretty awful, but it was uh, uh, frequently, or sometimes after the woman had gotten old, they might put her out to pasture working in farms and uh, in agricultural scenarios. But many died, many died young. Number five, this is uh, another real reality we'll talk about in a moment. Venereal disease was extraordinarily prevalent. It was probably exception, not the rule. In fact, by 1919, uh, as the laws began to uh, prohibit uh, drinking and prohibition and so forth, the Wild West comes to a screeching halt. Colorado, the wild town that it was, adopts prohibition really fast. One of the problems is the rampant transmission of venereal disease that had become, uh, it wasn't talked about, but it had become a serious issue uh, among health uh, professionals. But there's some stories here. Poker Alice generally took Sunday off. She was more a madam. She may have been a prostitute, but she ran uh, prostitutes in a number of places from Colorado to Deadwood and places in between. But she taught her lady Sunday school lessons on the Sabbath day. The, these are the kinds of stories we might not always hear. This is the kind of stuff though that I'm uh, particularly interested in uh, looking for. I wanna look at the myth and then I wanna build on that. I wanna see what's going on. If you look at stories 
in Wikipedia and you do online search searches, it isn't archetypal like Jung, Jung, but it's the same story being retold over and over, almost like a photocopy machine copying something, then you copy the copy and the copy. And I like to go back as far as I can to the original sources, which is really difficult because there aren't a lot of original sources. We actually have more information today than we did before, but what is it that, that's going on in there? And there's some really interesting core things. As a historian, you're frustrated because you don't have verifiable facts and information so often. Newspaper accounts are not always reliable. Fascinating, we rely on them. But we know more about Abraham Lincoln. We know more about George Washington. We know about, more about Andrew Jackson, Jackson and other figures even hundreds and two or 300 years uh, past than we do about probably all of these ladies put together. So what we've done is we're, we're trying to unravel some of the mystery or at least look at, uh, look at what, um, what has happened. Uh, some other uh, scenarios that I think are interesting is, well, this was a disenfranchised profession. Many of the women who could stay in it for a long time, and these, these are madams, those are the ones that, that would make it. Mostly there was a like I said, no retirement plan, a great deal of burnout. These are women who were actually able to stay in it for a long time. And they had interesting uh, hobbies. Uh, Bessie Rivers enjoyed photography. That's from Southwest Colorado, or Central Southwest Colorado. Uh, gardening, Laura, uh, it's, it's Evans, and, and some pronounce it A-N, E-V-A-N, some E-V-E-N-S, nobody seems to agree, uh, collected and did Rococo dolls, and she uh, uh, liked to crochet. Uh, Lillian Powers had tons of pets. Maddie Silks raised horses. Um, and there was uh, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of interesting little things we can glean uh, uh, from the, from, from just some of the, uh, you know, this is a little, my, my clicker is not working on me. Um, it shouldn't be surprising then that, as I suggested, some of the narratives are incomplete, they're contradictory or puzzling. And newspaper accounts are important, but it would be, again, unwise to take them at their face value. As we have talked about, I keep going back to this because so often uh, we want to go and we want to read what's in the paper. We got to remember that papers were basically funded very often by a political party or uh, their livelihood was enhanced for a while, uh, the newspaper or the reporters, by how they capitulated, not always, but to the important people in the town. Objectivity and, and stuff was just not part of the job description. And I, I've stopped and paused on this. I'll move a little bit quicker. But a, a woman like Dora Topa, excuse me, Dora Topham or, or Topham uh, would, be, um, would be running Microsoft today. She had a lot of money. She was almost a millionaire in her day. She's the infamous Bell London who I, I talk about her in Colorado. I can't find all the information I'd like, but in Salt Lake, where she came in Ogden, she made a, an incredible splash. She was the one who was commissioned by the Salt Lake City Mayor and the City Council to organize organized prostitution a block from the temple and try to put all, quote, rotten eggs in one basket. And she funded, it was going to be uh, funded by investors and to a point it was, but she sunk a lot of her own money into it. She was a fascinating character. I, I talk about her in several of my books. In fact, I want to do a book coming up on uh, uh, Josie Bassett, Dora Topham, and Eliza R. Snow, where we talk about these fascinating women in this massive cu cultural and geographic milieu, milieu uh, of the Great Basin. She was a wonderfully fascinating person and really uh, was uh, quite, quite interesting. Along with Mae Phelps, who she knew, 
both of them championed healthcare for the ladies that they uh, that they employed. They were pretty benign and good employers, and they worked. This is where we see uh, the new prostitution coming in uh, as the West is becoming civilized and we see demarcation points before prostitution was everywhere. Now it's in red light districts and it's going more and more underground, but the city fathers can't get rid of it even though they speak against it publicly because it is funding their health uh, to some extent, some of the public health, but mostly the city government and it's funding the the uh, the city government and is funding uh, uh, all the other municipal improvements. So we we see this uh, uh, scenario going on. Another person that I found very fascinating, and I like to deal with her. She's one of the very few people who has who has who has written a. Uh, uh, a, a text about herself, Lydia Taylor. There's a common denominator here, uh, and that is many of the women were abused. Many of the women were sexually abused. Many of the women um, came from very domineering families uh, and or were orphans. Lydia Taylor was fascinating. This is what she wrote. I, I, this drew me to her. I read her book several times. I sat, this is as a little girl who basically became, if you've read uh, Stephen Crane and uh, Dreiser and stuff, uh, she said, I sat watching the heat waves in the distance. This is when she's nine or 10, uh, or so she claims, rolling and, uh, excuse me, in the distance, roll, rolling and tumbling in the, there were fleecy clouds taking shape, first a house, then an animal, and ever so many shapes horizon seem seemingly the end of the world yet in my vision I went out beyond this to the pretty world and she talks about going out on her own she's pretty much forced out of the house fascinating fascinating character these are the, the this is probably a must read if you're interested in this and again it's one of the accounts when we talk about secretive we we're looking at specifically for a number of reasons, Butch Cassidy, uh, and we're looking at uh, the Wild Bunch, we're looking at uh, Sundance. And yet, while they have been very careful to hide and, and very successful, they're some of the most successful robbers in history, they, they, become, uh, they become fascinating to look at. I've done a, a, a some pieces on this, and I intend one of these times to do a, a, a story of Butch's stories. Very interesting. Mormon guy gone bad. Sundance, too. There's a lot, like I said, the mythology is built up around this, and they liked it. But as we go back to these scenarios, and we look at Ed a Place, and we look at some of these women who are so fascinating, and about upstairs girls in general, I think we could make a st statement that that it's overly romanticized, unfairly villainized, and marginalized. And now we're taking a look at this. And Rogers, Annie Rogers, was um, a fascinating character too, who uh, took up with um, Kid Curry. And we have some information about her. We have Fanny, who was the madam with the heart of gold, good friends with Butch and Sundance. And, uh, and, and she's, she was one who never betrayed him. She was actually kind of a, a romantic at heart. Butch, Butch said, uh, Butch was actually well read, read National Geographic and was pretty, uh, pretty literate for the time and, and read a lot. He made the comment, this is apocryphal, I can't, I can't document it, but it, it is a pity she's a whore, uh, referring to Fanny. Uh, and uh, really interesting uh, woman from Fort Worth. We have other kinds of mythology. Calamity Jane was built up in the pulps. She was a tragic, tragic character, a prostitute in hog ranches, the lowest of the low, but uh, had a problem with alcohol, made a lot of money. Most of the stuff we know about her is part of the mythology and the pulp fictions. Most of the time, she was a very unhappy woman. She died an alcoholic. 
what was it like? Uh, the, behind the makeup and the gaudy clothing, there were real w women. Uh, it had, again, like a, a poor retirement plan. I keep going back to that. Incidentally, the mirror and the shoes were either Anne or Josie Bassett's from uh, out near Green River. There's a, uh, a, a period skirt. I think it's a little bit late. I don't know enough about clothing, but I know they let me come in and photograph it. I was very interested. So what was it like? The first thing I think is that there was a trade vocabulary that that sporting men and women had to know. There were a lot of terms, we call them shibble of the snap from the Old Testament, insider terms. Uh, you, 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 you entered a, a pretty foreign world. And I think it was also fascinating that you gave up a lot of your identity. The names that would become, that you would be known by professionally were advertising monikers to uh, protect the family and to protect a person's privacy. They changed. Also, it was a good way to stay out of legal trouble. Oh, this was a profession that involved a lot of movement. Okay. Um, another thing I think that was a part of this was the the fear of the fear of occupational hazards, uh, specifically pregnancy. There were um, there were all kinds of folklore remedies that they, that that people could buy. Uh, not just uh, women in this business, but uh, they were all talked about euphemistically, but it was part of the, the fear that uh, pregnancy would occur. And there were all sorts of uh, uh, birth control devices, but, but specifically uh, uh, potions uh, that didn't work. I think another thing we need to look at too is the, the, the amount of vice that is just naturally inherent. Most women became alcoholics or, or drank way too much. I know of very, very little or very few scenarios where the women uh, involved didn't drink a lot. And part of it was to be dulled and forget. Also keep in mind that uh, heroin was developed to help people get off uh, uh, opiates. Opiates you could buy over the counter. Everything, cough medicine, baby medicine had some kind of an opium derivative in it, laudlum. One of the reasons why many uh, ladies in this profession became serious drug addicts is one, it made their eyes look pale, which was an in vogue look, and it was cheaper than alcohol. So it wouldn't take much, um, it wouldn't take much to um, uh, get you pretty loaded um, opium was smoked, um, the different kinds of pipes. These are from Jacksonville, Oregon. Another uh, curse, of course, was venereal disease. And, and uh, the, the treatments were, were horrific. You would often take mercury treatments and you'd know when you were ready to quit when your gums bleed and your teeth started to fall out. Uh, uh, mercury treatments, uh, Lewis and Clark, if you read the Lewis and Clark expeditions they took, quite a bit of opiate and how they treated the men was sounds pretty awful um but 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 mer uh but mercury treatment this is a syringe uh similar perhaps but a later version uh for men uh and by the time the lewis and clark expedition was done um they had been treated a number of times it did work but many uh, venereal diseases will 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 fade in and out Fires were horrific. There was a lot of physical, um, physical things that could happen. Um, what's a nice girl doing in a place like this? Monday's parlor girl would be Wednesday, Wednesday's blue collar whore. And frequently, uh, if this, the woman stayed in the profession, she would be a crib girl or a street walker hazed on opium by, by, by the metaphor at Friday. And it was, uh, it was, a, uh, it was a, there, there was no job uh, advancement very often. Once in a while, but you, the clock was ticking, beauty was ticking, uh, and, and it was a, a, a profession that was healthily, uh, was, was not healthy. Um, there are some curious, uh, I'm going to move over that, um, 
uh, that's uh, another uh, uh, scenario, uh, another s story. Rosa May, oh my gosh, um, was one of the many who started out uh, doing well, but ended up in Bodhi and a drug addict and, and tragically took her own life. Uh, one of the favorite methods of doing this was with uh, acids and horrible uh, kinds of medication, rat poisoning, um, but but she she's one that uh, there was there have been some stories written about her. Uh, they haven't they were more self published, but you can find some information out about her. Um, I think we'll skip the ghost, the ghost stories are fascinating. Um, uh, Julia was uh, was tragically killed. Remember, as a prostitute in this day and age, you had no civil rights. Once you became a prostitute, rarely, rarely was the legal system going to work for you. In fact, you were in and out of uh, jail and, and uh, physical violence was an occupational hazard. This is more of the wild bunch. So with her, she, she was a, a popular, uh, what we would call a crib girl, cottage girl. Um, we have some more uh, Laura Bullion, fascinating. Um, uh, I, I talk about her a little bit in Wild Bunch Women. Uh, this, this is just a corral, uh, a, a person who was kind of run up uh, on their last leg, uh, as it were, would frequently uh, be in a, in a hovel. Hog ranches, as they were called, were, were generally the lowest of the low, maybe above a streetwalker. And they facilitated Army, army barracks, and they were, uh, because they grew so much pork, were often situated in old pig barns, which the word hog ranch, and they were often uh, one or two or three miles away. Many of the women would also uh, moonlight as laundresses, laundresses and prostitutes in the army, uh, uh, in the army uh, as we know it in the West, frequently were, uh, we're, we're, we're making money on the side uh, and it was a way to get in touch. There was also another uh, situation I think, and as we're winding down uh, here, I think we've got a couple more minutes, um, that mental illness was not talked about. Women had no rights, even until the mid 1800s, frequently no property rights. Mental illness was handled poorly. It was generally not a problem for a man if he wanted to, to take his wife uh, uh, and, and put her away. Uh, mentally, um, a man could go to a judge and say, I think, I think my wife is crazy and she would be locked up. I have a couple of stories uh, in, in, in the book that's coming out about uh, a young school teacher who was taken advantage of by Lucky Baldwin, a famous millionaire uh, in the in the gold rush, and uh, and 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 he was really a, kind of a brutal uh, harasser, and and uh, essentially she became pregnant, and uh, she sought child support, and she publicly went and and uh, tried to get the press behind her, but he basically bought off the press and made her look bad in print and then went to a judge, called him up uh, either on the phone or no, said, we gotta lock this lady up. She was locked up in a mental institution for a year. Um, and, and that became a difficult thing. Um, one of my favorite, uh, Ella uh, Wellington, who was a brilliant, brilliant manager, perhaps one of the best money managers that we have seen, she had fits of uh, horrid depression. And after she had arrived at the pinnacle of her profession, and theoretically she, depending on, on her and uh, who you want to look at, mostly was a manager, but she had a, a, a very uh, expensive uh, place in Colorado and she, like many women took drugs to sleep, but she had learned that, and there's, there's the history of her in Salt Lake too. Uh, she had learned that her former husband who had kicked her out 
and kept the stepkids, but she, and she loved them, but she was, uh, I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but almost it looked like personality uh, disorders or uh, some kind of manic depression uh, or uh, uh, wh whatever it was, but he came back and, and ran into her at her place of business and she was again at the pinnacle and he was happy and she came in uh, at the end of the evening and was so disillusioned with her life that as she walked up the stairs, she said, I'm so happy. Oh, so happy. I'm just going to blow my brains out. And she walked up uh, and a little while later stuck a 32 caliber pistol in her head and did just that. Uh, blew her blew her uh, brains out again one of these tragic elements um, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, one of the one of the wonderful mythologies red stocking she is perhaps the only success story we have uh, or one of the few where um, she became a legend and I talk about her mythologically we don't know anything about her but we know she exists but she came in and out of the Colorado gold rush as a millionaire and walked out. Uh, uh, this is a, a picture I took in an old brothel that's now a photo studio, but uh, it was dark and I, I, uh, had, a, I had a chance to, uh, to just play around with some of the lighting. Physical abuse was a reality. Legal harassment was uh, commonplace. And behind those makeup, I, I use that, uh, li I'll use that line again, and the gaudy clothes, there was bitterness, disease, and disenfranchisement. This would be a typical little uh, cabin that, that uh, someone, uh, especially in the more rural areas, might stay. Um, so thank you for, for coming. I'm so glad to have a chance to talk with you. Um, I am ready to take a few questions. Okay, Michael, we had yeah. a question. Uh, we have a question here. Uh -huh. um, it's uh, why do you think they were good managers? Can you provide some examples of the challenges? Yes. They faced? How did the wealthy ones become that way? Could it be said that the madams exploited the women who worked for them? Oh, yes, yes, yes. They certainly it, it's uh, it's there are notable exceptions of exploitation, but mostly mostly it was quite a bit of exploitation. It was it was the it was the, the way of doing business. I would think that a, a lot of, uh, some, of, some of the people that were, were um, pretty successful were just good money managers. They were just good business women and they saw opportunities, took risks. Most of the time they lost the money. And I think if you look at them historically, many, if not all, really ended up spending money on a younger man who, even though they were really hardcore businesswomen, had a, uh, a blind eye and, and frequently they were taken to the bank and, and, and not uh, do, lost, lost their fortunes. Other, another thing I think I might add is one of, the, one of the difficulties is that the ever flexible law structure as the civilization became more, uh, more populated with uh, women, you you have two groups uh, that are leaving uh, in the in the West. Men who are exploiting my I, I don't mean that pejoratively, but exploiting mining and uh, uh, lumber and cattle who want to go in, make their fortune, and come back. And then you have the builders and. M many of the women that we're, we're talking at started out those towns, rural towns and, and boom towns that managed to survive the boom bust uh, saw that as families moved in, the laws became stricter and stricter. So there was a flexible and it wasn't, it was difficult to know where you stood legal structure and that became one of the problems. I, I, I could answer that for about two hours, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll I'll stop there. Is there another question? Um, yes, there's another question. Um, I know you talked a lot about the Western ladies, but mm -hmm. do you have any stories about Park City ladies? 
you know what? I wanted to do Park City Ladies, and I, I have to save that almost for another whole discussion. Um, uh, hopefully, hopefully um, somebody will want invite me back. Uh, yes, it, Park City is a typical mining town, and I, I mean that in every good sense of the word. Telluride, Aspen, uh, and, and after a while, Durango, all these towns, they, they, they were built exploitively. In other words, uh, early in the Colorado gold rush, people just thought they'd get in and get out. They were setting up camps at 10,000 feet with tents, and they were building buildings that just, just would barely get them through uh, the winter because they, they were gonna make their fortune. And so a town that has a longevity, like Park City, um, as, as it becomes more successful and in, 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 in the mine doesn't play out or different, uh, like Leadville, different, which was the second largest city in Colorado for, for quite a while until silver was uh, deregulated in what was 1893, uh, 94, 95. Um, they, uh, uh, so all these towns, uh, what I talked about, the exploitive and the building, I, I, have a, I have kind of a chapter on that as I looked at it and they follow a pattern and they build and, and then um, you have uh, women who have staying power, but you have, um, you have some wonderful stories. And I, uh, my, the book that we're scheduled to do is Madams of Colorado and, and Park City is a major, no pun intended, but major player. We've got some, besides Dora Topham and some others, some really wonderful people. But, but, it, but, it, but it has that same, it has that same economic structure, but it survived. I didn't answer that real well uh, or as thoroughly as I'd like, but um, I would love to come back and talk about Park City and, 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 and Utah in general. But, but this, the broader overview becomes pretty important and once we have that under our belt, then it, then it becomes uh, easy to see how all these setups occur, um, even in a city like Salt Lake. Okay, other question? Um, um, I don't see any other questions, but okay. uh, does anyone uh, want to unmute themselves and ask a question? You're getting a lot of thank yous, Michael. People oh, love well, I'm so back. happy. We'll talk again, so. Oh, you know, in this COVID world, I'm, I'm, I'm happy people are still interested in history. And in fact, if anything, maybe we're more interested. So. Yeah. Um, anyone have any other questions? Um, you can either put in chat or you can unmute either way. No. I don't see anything. Michael, thank okay. you. We really appreciate your time, your expertise on the subject matter. We get a lot of questions at the Park City Museum about prostitution, so I thought this was a good way to maybe answer some general questions. So, so um, and I don't think there's any other questions, but um, well, of, so, oh, you got one? Okay. Yeah, what's, what okay. is recommend a movie that has the most, most likely depiction of uh, prostitution in those days? Can you, can you hear me? Michael, can you hear him? Oh, looks like he's frozen for some reason. Uh, okay. It's Western movie, yeah. Okay. Well, that's all right. It's gonna be the case and that's not Okay. What was that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the answer. Someone answered? Okay. Um, okay, so thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I will try to get him back at another time. It looks like we lost him. So I uh, know maybe he's here. Um, anyway, so, um, but thank you for coming and I will try to get him back to talk more about, you know, maybe prostitution in Park City. So, um, oh, yes. And, oh, I think oh, I'm- Okay, great. Yeah, I, I'm back. So yes, in fact, I, I had, uh, uh, I, I wasn't really timed. I have more on that. I just, I, 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 I probably should have cut a couple things. So, okay. <laughs> but anyway, um, I guess we'll uh, sign off and be be safe, everyone. I do so, have one question, Michael. Oh, okay. you, have a, you have a website. You know, I I um, I will send a link. Uh, 
I, I had that, I was, in fact, to, to Diane, um, you can hit me uh, at, uh, at Facebook or you could, um, uh, I re, I'm revamping everything and so I'm off, but uh, if you want to, my, my email is mrudder36 at gmail.com. And I will send a, a list in. I, I just had had it ready to go, and I just forgot to send it. So, but but the, the cheapest way to get a book is probably on Amazon. Um, I love small bookstores, but um, or if if you know, I'll be in Park City soon. So, well, it's so. certainly a fascinating topic. Well, thank it you. Be, it, it could be an entire semester of a class you know oh, I mean, it, you know it, 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 it is in the hour oh Especially well it, it, like i say i i intended to um dive into a little more park city but the i i have research for a book and i just i i i'm fascinated by this chapter of our history so mm -hmm. yeah be in touch with me so thank you okay and Michael, thank you again for okay. your time. I okay. really appreciate it. And oh. thank you all for coming. Yeah. Well, and uh, me, Park City Museum power to y'all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you, I'll... Diane. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks. She's a Renaissance woman. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Michael. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you okay. Well. I will sign off now. I, goodbye, everyone. <laughs>